for listening to Radio VR with me, Juliet Spare. According to the government's Department of Health, there were approximately 800 more suicides among men and 155 more among women between 2008 and 2010. This number was higher than expected based on their historical trends. The report preventing suicide in England one year on said a rise in poor health status associated with the recession had also been found not only for those unemployed, but also among people who had jobs. Suicide continues to be more than three times as common in males compared to females, and one in four people are said to suffer from some sort of mental health problem. Mixed anxiety and depression is the most common mental disorder in Britain. Depression affects one in five older people. But does talking about suicide help society deal with mental illness? Taking part in today's discussion on men and mental health is Tim Roberts, who's joining us on Skype. Tim is a current patient within the mental health system. He has experienced chronic depression for 20 years and is currently receiving therapy on the NHS. I'm also joined in the studio by Tim Lott, a novelist who has written extensively about his experiences of depression and a nervous breakdown. He's written several books, including The Scent of Dried Roses in 1996, which looks at his family history of depression. We're also joined by Michael Dunn, a psychotherapist who's worked as a psychotherapist in private practice with lots of clients for over 10 years. And during that time, he's also worked with groups in the NHS and for charities. So really, the discussion is about depression and mental health in men. And first of all, Tim Roberts, I'd like to ask you, really. You said you've experienced chronic depression for 20 years and you've been institutionalised. Could you tell us about your experience of, of living with depression? Yeah, well, I was uh, first diagnosed uh, so about 20 years ago. Um, I had really had problems, I think, since uh, my, my teenage years, but never quite had, um, we never really quite had the nerve to go and to, to go and sort it out or get, go and speak to somebody, but it got to a, a, a really bad place. And um, as I say, about 20 years ago, I went to a doctor, um, I went through a course of um, cognitive behavioral therapy, and I didn't really think that I was getting the help that I needed. Um, it's almost like I had to bang doors down to, to, to speak with somebody. I was put on a course of tablets. Um, the CBT come to an end, but as uh, the years went on, certainly a couple of years after I was diagnosed, um, I I attempted suicide because I was living in a, a very dark place at the time, and it was not a cry for help. I I took some very dangerous pills, prescribed pills, and um, lost several days. Um, in a and e and then was transferred to the mortally hospital where i spent best part of a year uh, since then i've had ect treatment which uh, is generally known um, as electric shock treatment to people and various other um, cbt therapies uh, but four and a half years ago i met a psychotherapist um, who's been working with me on something called schema therapy which is really kind of going back into my past and and seeing where my my defects may have been born into me as it were if that makes sense and uh, but in general I found as a man with depression and admitting to depressions it is a very difficult thing to do uh, you're instantly judged um, I've I would say more judged um, sort of badly, as it were, than somebody saying, oh, that's a shame. I hope you get better. So I don't know if that's experience for women as well, but certainly as a man, I found it very difficult to confess it to anybody and also to even really uh, be accepted within my family that I suffer with chronic depression. Uh, so many questions, but uh, maybe can I, if I could just start with, um, with the ECT and the cognitive behavioural therapy treatments and then yeah. you talked about your schema treatment um yeah what, what's worked for you uh, well the treatment the the therapy that I've been on for the last four and a half years as I'm very very lucky because I met um, um I met a psychotherapist uh, through the NHS when I was re-referred because I've gone in and out of the system and then when I've when I've had a, a relapse into depression sometimes I've been able to cope with it just on the medication 
Um, I, I take 20 milligrams of citilopram, but sometimes it just goes down so bad that I go back into uh, thoughts of self-harm. And around about five, uh, five and a half years ago, it got really bad again. So I was re-referred. And through that referral process, I met my current psychotherapist um, who assessed me. It was many, many, many questions. And uh, because I had I had very specific issues, a lot of them to do with my body image, um, a lot of them to do with uh, social, social um, isolation, et cetera, et cetera. So the schema therapies work with me because I've been able to go on to specifics um, going back to my school days, in fact, when I was a bit of a, a kind of, if you'd like, a, a Billy No Mates, but it was not through choice. It's just that I didn't, I didn't feel as though I could interact with other kids. And then as I become a teenager, the same with teenagers. And then as I become an adult with adults, I don't socialize very well. Um, so that therapy has, has helped me um, have to face those things. And part, part of the therapy process is to actually challenge myself and put myself through um, situations that are not very comfortable, um, but to experience them and then come back and then review them with my therapist. I, I also heard mindfulness um, mentioned earlier, which um, my current therapist uh, referred me to, and it is a sensational treatment and it needs to be spoken about more. Mindfulness. Um, who can elaborate on that for me? Michael Dunn? Yeah, well, mindfulness is um, um, <clears throat> mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, anyway, is, is recommended in, uh, in the UK by NICE as a treatment for depression. Um, and it's, um, it shows good results. It's really about um, um, the, when people do mindfulness, what they usually do is they they focus on their their breathing um, and it stops the um, the thinking process the idea is really to kind of break the thinking process and the thinking process in depression is one of, um, of kind of chronic rumination on the same problems so you go over and over and over the same situation and you you, you maybe try and think you what yes, yourself out of the situation but it's it's often unsuccessful that that's a common um, description of, of what happens for, for many people in depression and I suppose mindfulness can can do something to address that. Before we return to you and your experiences and uh, expertise as a psychotherapist uh, I want to introduce Tim, Tim Lott into the conversation. Um, you've written extensively about your own experiences of depression. Having heard from Tim Roberts there, um, were there any similarities or, or would you be able to sort of tell tell us your journey through depression um well i haven't had electric shock therapy my experience of depression i don't know how old tim is but mine also stretches back now uh, nearly 30 years my first episode <clears throat> though i think i was probably always depressed on some level um as a child yeah. Uh, I wasn't particularly, um, yeah, I, I, I just didn't feel quite right, you know. I didn't feel, I didn't feel what I suspected other people were feeling. There was a sort of melancholy about me, um, and which it didn't really become identified in my mind to, to, as depression till I was <clears throat> about 30 when it was very serious and I had four years of depression, uh, which at that time, we're talking the 80s, <clears throat> was still not really spoken about and certainly I didn't identify it as depression and I was very reluctant to um, admit to myself that I suffered a mental illness. I mean, I still am actually, um, but I don't find it easy um, because it, it was stigmatic then and it remains stigmatic now, although it shouldn't be. Um, but uh, since then, I've spent as a writer the next, uh, and as a person the next, and I was suicidally depressed, um, and, and recovered as a result of taking antidepressant drugs, which I've been on and off uh, over the last 20, 30 years. Um, so I had it very severely. I never attempted suicide, but I certainly went through a long period when I, uh, when I wanted to die. Um, 
and uh, I um, and I, I think Mr. Depression is a, is um, is still a mystery. You know, it's not something we can easily pin down. All these things help some people. Drugs help some people, though. Some people they make worse, and some people they lead the same. Psychotherapy helps some people. Mindfulness helps some people. Um, so it's a very strange phenomenon. It's not. It's not. It's not like. It's often described now as, oh, you know, it's an illness. Well, it is, but it isn't as well. You know, it's also to do with the way you think about the world. You know, and the way you think about the world somehow is reflected in your body, and the way your body is is reflected in the way you think. And it, it's a complicated equation. Um, it's not simple, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, I, 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 I don't think I'll, I'll ever be able to explain it. But I recognise Mike's um, explanation of overthinking. I think that's a very strong part. Certainly I was so... It's a very almost a product of our heady society. You know, we're very mm. over-intellectualised. Mm. And certainly I was... And I was at university at the time. And I was almost entirely lost in sort of reasoning and rationalisation and trying mm. to work it out and trying to solve the problem, which was all leading me to madness, you know. And, mm. and at the end of it, I was I was brilliantly rational. I mean, people, I got a job as editor of a major new magazine when I was at the worst bo moment because I was so rational. But that rationality was, was what was killing me, you know, mm. and that strength was what was killing me because I was very mm. strong through all those years. And depressive is not weak people, very strong mm. people whose, whose strength turns against them. And they destroy themselves from their inability to turn around and say, "You know what? I'm weak. I, I can't do this." You know, mm. and that's that. That's a real barrier to their recovery. There's something. Yeah. That, and, uh, and go, I think Mike, it, please. I think you know that the other part of that is they're not as emotionally articulate as as you know they would like to be necessarily, or they're, or they're emotionally inarticulate. I, I was tremendously emotionally articulate. Mm. <laughs> I mean, I could talk. Brilliantly on my emotions, you know, right. um, did me absolutely no good whatsoever. Right. Okay. And uh, I was extremely, uh, you know, I've written about it for years, but mm. I mean, even then, I was very, very good at talking about my emotions. Mm. Didn't didn't solve the problem remotely. Right. See, in this discussion about de depression, we've already had the words rational, strong, emotionally articulate. Um, they're not words that have been used to associate with depression that I've potentially read in, in a lot of the media coverage of suicide and mental illness. Is there a way that you think the media should deal with depression and mental illness that would actually benefit those who suffer from it? Back to you, Tim Roberts. You talked about body image and masculinity issues. I mean, is that something that you've decided yourself that is an issue or do you think that what you see in mainstream media or around you has some part to play in that? I think it has some part to play in it. For my own case, I think it's something that really just came into my own head when I was um, a teenager. Plus, you know, the usual, uh, because I was at an all-boys school in south-east London, it was quite a tough place to be. And I wasn't quite as big as the other boys, so th there was a certain amount of bullying. It, was, it wasn't a, a massive issue. I don't really sort of um, associate with my depression with being bullied at school, but it was always being said to me that I was too small, I was too skinny, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know what I was too small and too skinny for. So, yeah, there's a certain amount of conditioning there from, from somewhere with somebody saying to you. And even my own dad, actually, was um, when I was 15, was saying, well, you know, you're going to you're gonna have to start sort of growing up and getting bigger because you're going to be in the workplace in a couple of years' time. And it's a kind of tormenting thing to do to somebody. Um, I, I was also, um, like your other Tim, um, quite a, a melancholy uh, child. So I was always um, a bit different and, like I say, sort of standing on the uh, periphery of everything at school, um, not really joining in things. So I think I was actually somehow magnifying myself to these people as a bit of an odd bod. And um, so therefore, that's that, that's why maybe they bullied me or called me names or whatever. But um, I think recently, the I mean, just just in the last week, obviously, um, since uh, Robin Williams died, the, the, the media reaction has been it, it's, it's a mixed bag. There's been some absolutely brilliant um, pieces, particularly one in The Guardian last week I read. But 
immediately there was uh, an outpouring of sympathy on social networking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But then the day after, saw his daughter having to remove her Twitter account because people were sending uh, sick messages to her. Um, there was a piece in the Daily Mail last week which was followed by comments saying, "Well, what did he have to be depressed about? He is a film star." He's got a family, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Like these things will change that. So I, I I put a tweet out the other day, which has just expressed my my feelings about this. In that you would say, wake up as a chronic depressive on Wednesday morning. You would go out, play the lotto, win the lotto Wednesday night, but Thursday morning you'd be a millionaire, but you'd still be a chronic depressive. If that makes sense. It does make sense. And actually, I want to pick up on the point that you made earlier about when. You attempted suicide, and it was called this this cry for help. Yeah. Um, and again, it's sort of going on to sort of looking at the responses, the negative responses towards that very high profile death of Robin Williams, and the yeah. that that people said, what what on earth has he got to be depressed about? This yeah. sort of kind of trivialization of depression is is that one of the barriers you'd say? Um, I address the other ma- members of the panel here. In, in people actually getting it right or, or really understanding it, because you... well, I mean, I think there's a huge misunderstanding uh, between all, in all sectors, even in I think med- mental health professionals to some extent, but less so, much less so, between unhappiness and depression. I mean, they they are very different things, um, though they are linked, you know, and. Um, and of people, of course, who say, well, what's he got to be depressed about are talking about unhappiness. They're, they're saying, what have you got to be unhappy about, which is a completely different thing. You know, depression doesn't feel like unhappiness. No. Depression isn't like unhappiness. It's a very different feeling, you know, and depression depression is like being dead. It's not, but walking around. It's mm. it's not like being unhappy. I take unhappiness quite, I mean, I'm... I'm, I'm Unhappiness is a normal, natural, everyday emotion for anybody. Anybody feels unhappy, you know, or miserable or, or offended or hurt or, you know, they, these are the stuff of t- daily life. Depression is nothing like any of that. You know, depression is, 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 is death, but walking around, you know, and that's the ultimate mental torment because you, you walk and talk and people look at you and they think you're normal and inside you're just a zombie, you know, and, and, and you, ha- you can't accept love. You can't give love. You don't care. You don't care about yourself. You don't care about anybody else. Um, you're utterly selfish um, because uh, because you can't. You're you're trying to survive on, on some level. Um, so it's it's and it's invisible. It's all invisible. So it's a very horrible, horrible thing in, in that sense. And I can't mm-hmm. express to anybody the mental torment of it um, because it's so. It's not even suffering, it's beyond suffering. As I say, it's death, you know. And uh, um, I, well, I wanted to ask the other Tim something, and I, I, I thought yeah. what I, one of the things I wanted to put into this equation is, is one of the things I suffered for many years, more, many more years than I should have suffered from, because I, 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 I was sort of traumatised by the idea of treatment. <clears throat> and, I, and even taking drugs for it really put me off and mm-hmm. put me off for a long time. So I wanted to say, A, for God's sake, if you're depressed, try medication. <laughs> really, what have you got to lose? You know, I know yeah. I know quite a lot of people who are depressed or have suffered depression. You won't touch drugs because they think, I'm, you know, this is me, I can beat it. You know, they're so misguided, you know, and you've really got nothing to lose by having a go. It might not work, but I mean, really have a go. And the thing I want to ask Tim is, is his experience of electric shock treatment, because we've all got a very negative image of that from watching things like Mum Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Yes. I, I don't actually know whether it works or not, but I, I understand it can work quite well. And I, I'm, I'm in the business here of trying to knock down a few taboos, so I wonder if, if yeah. Tim has, has got anything to say about that. Yeah, well, it was a last resort because I was uh, I was an inpatient at the Maudsley Hospital in South London and I had gone through various um, CBT treatments. Um, I was constantly self-harming. Uh, they'd had me on all sorts of medication. And then it got to the point where 
well, every time I was going back into the community, I was uh, I was a danger to myself. Um, so they offered me ECT treatment, and and strange you say that because my first my my, my first um, image was uh, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Was in fact um, for me. I mean, you know, you you, you go into a ward, you're put to sleep, and, uh, and they do it to you, and you go back to the ward, and you wake up and you're a bit drowsy. I had two a week for six weeks. So I had twelve treatments altogether. For me, it didn't work, but. From the point of view of the, of the doctors um, ad advising it, I could, looking back, I can see why because I was a frust I was becoming a frustrating case for them, to be honest. Whereas they hadn't quite diagnosed me correctly at the time either. I don't really think they knew what to do with me. But there are people that it's worked for. I met people on the ward that it's it's made a lot better, and um, so. But are there any ill effects of it? Uh, there was, um, for me, short-term memory loss. Uh, that that's probably the worst one. I, I it got to the point where I would bump into people because I lived around the area where the Maudsley is situated at the time. I lived around sort of East Dulwich, Peckham, Camberwell, and there's people that I grew up with. And uh, somebody would come up to me and say, "Hi, Tim, how are you doing?" It would take a little while for it to register who that was. Um, I was told that the amount of treatments I had was quite an in, in, intense amount of treatments, like two a week for six weeks. So whether that had... Um, but that, pa adverse... that, that passed, though, presumably. Sorry? That passed. That... Oh, yes, that yes, that did pass, yeah. It took a while to pass, it, and it did make me feel slightly... Um, I don't know, you, you, I probably hate this word, but um, yeah, it did make me feel slightly out of it, zombified for a little while, but yes, it did pass. Did you regret having that treatment? I regret having it now. I regret the process that, um, because now I'm with such a great uh, psychotherapist, uh, and when I when I moved um, across London, because you, this is another thing as well, <laughs> is that treatment is quite inconsistent. And I moved across to uh, northwest London, so therefore everything had to be transferred over. But I was quite lucky because I met um, quite a young um, psychiatrist from from Italy on the NHS, and he he had different methods. And and one of the first things he said to me. He was being careful, but he, he did say to me, there's no way I'd have given you ECT treatment. It would have been straight into, you know, sort of deep kind of therapy, a bit of therapeutic, um, invite, uh, sorry, a, a talking therapy on, on top of the medication. I mean, you're very unusual, Michael. Tim, aren't you? Because, you know, th these kinds of um, therapies aren't, aren't readily available for most people no. on the NHS. I mean, that, that's the thing. And I mean, absolutely. And I think... Um, you know, going back to the whole business of stigma, it's very difficult for, for men generally to go to the doctors anyway. Um, yes. But to go with, with something that's a kind of psychological difficulty or, you know, I think often people don't know what's wrong with them. They don't know what they've got. They don't know that they're ill or, you know, they just feel different or, or you know, um, melancholic, as, as, as both the teams have said. Um, and then the media don't help, you know, with stories about, you know, some of the headlines, you know, I mean, Frank Bruno was a particularly um, graphic one, you know, where he was humiliated and, and vilified, yes. really. Um, um, you know, and he was somebody who's, who who kind of experienced manic depression. Um, paparazzi waiting for him outside of the um, the inpatient unit that he was in. Um, and then all those stories about, you know, obviously seriously ill people aren't standing behind you on the tube and pushing you onto the tracks, all of these sort of scare stories. When actually it's people with mental illness who, who are kind of on the receiving end of... Um, they're the ones that are scared. Th that's right, yeah. They're the ones <laughs> that are scared, yeah. Yeah, they're the re on the receiving end of, of, um, of kind of violence and humiliation by, by others, you know. I've taken drugs for, on and off for many years i've never had any side effects whatsoever so uh, yeah. they just made me feel better so mm. there's there's no bad yeah. effects to, whatsoever that's but, the same but, for me as well mm. yeah. Oh you know that that's that's not uncommon but as tim said they don't work for some people uh some people find it difficult i think to get on onto them i think some of the some of the patients i've had have 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 combined being in therapy with me with taking antidepressants, and I th and I, what I often see is that they're really helpful in the first instance, and and certainly they help them to continue to come to the therapy. There's usually a point at which um, 
almost at which the sort of self gets kind of past them or underneath them and mm. things feel normal again after you've been on them for, for quite mm. a, Things feel as they were. It uh, can be quite hard to get off. Yeah, and then they become I mean, difficult uh, to I get mean, off. I mean, I'm not, not... I mean, I've tried to come off them. I'm off them now, but I mean, my last attempt to come off them, I became extraordinarily bad-tempered for a long... I had to go back on them again because yeah. I was so irritable. Um, and, and, I mean, having said they don't have any side effects... You know, they are they are quite tricky to to wean yeah. yourself off. You've got to be quite careful and do it very slowly. Yeah, there's really really good information on the um, Royal College of Psychiatry website about coming off antidepressants. There's mm. a fantastic. Um, well, they're still kind of sold as being oh you can come off them no problem. Yeah, they don't, that's and it's not the case really at not, all. It's quite difficult. Yeah, I mean I'm yeah. I'm I'm working with someone and he he's planning to come off his you know sometime next year and we're talking about it now, you know preparing for that. Yes. Go on, Tim. Did you want yeah, to I was going to say, because I came off the telepram um, a couple of years ago and I just decided to take myself off of them and I started getting quite serious palpitations mm. and, and all sorts of things going on in my head. Uh, but there was, because I didn't, I was, again, I was really sort of, you know, I'm just going to be brave about this now. I'm going to take myself off them. I've been on them long enough and just went to immediate nothing rather than wow. uh, where I have come off of them in a controlled situation, which is the say I'm on 20 milligrams now, go down to, say, 10, and then cut the 10 in half, cut the half in half, et cetera, et cetera. So over several weeks, really, probably about six weeks. And that's a common feature of people with the whole um, range of mental illness when they're on antipsychotics or medication for, for bipolar often when there's a, when people feel better they they kind of just want to come off the medication you know they, they they don't see a reason for for taking it and um, they forget almost what it was like and um, they can they can come off the medication and and often when when people get on well you know the first first question a psychiatrist will have to is are you taking your medication you know um, um, and that's why can, people end up back can on, I ask you on, a question about on that, awards, like. yeah I mean, oh, the vexed question for me was, should I bother? You know, and I, I just kind of, I mean, there's not really a rational reason for me wanting to come off medication in some mm. ways because they don't cause me any problems. I just don't want to feel that my entire life I'm, I'm uh, under, I'm, I'm being essentially, um, that, I, that I'm on a, on a psych, psychotropic drug of some kind. Mm. But, I mean, there's no rational reason. I mean, mm. but what I was going to ask you is, it, you know, am I in some sense misguided? I mean, should I, should I not worry about it? Just say, oh, well, fine, you know, they don't do any harm, you know, so I'll just keep popping them. I mean, I mean, you know, it's sort of most matter of, I think the other Tim will probably, you know, there's a certain personal pride in it, to getting off them, but I mean, I don't know if there's any rational yes. reason. So it's a question to yourself, really, isn't it? Well, I think it's, it's a, if, you, if you're asking about should you come off your medication, it, it's actually a question to your doctor. Um, in a way, but um, but I, if I was if somebody I was working with was taking medication and they, and they want and they wanted to come off them, then I, I would spend time with people thinking about that. Yeah, in quite a kind of considered way, um, and I, I think everybody's different. So, um, but what I'm trying to get at is, I mean, to take an obvious example, I know you know I'm, I'm completely fine. I'm off medication. Mm. And I feel great, but but I am also aware, or I imagine. That I'm vulnerable, you know. Yeah. That I could, I, I can take, you know, a bl a, some kind of blow. Yeah, could 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 trigger me. So that that, that whereas really it works as a sort of prophylactic, perhaps, you know. In other circumstances, I think all of the the statistics show that um, people who do um, come off their medication um, can experience another episode within certain amounts of time. Um, and this is w one of the reasons mindfulness is being recommended as a treatment is because it, it stands up well there, um, because it's an ongoing, the idea is that you make an ongoing daily commitment to it, really for the rest of your life. Yes. Um, I mean, I, 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 you know, I'm, not, I'm not certain I would want to say whether, you, you know, whether people should take antidepressants for the, for the rest of their lives, but I suppose um, if you feel... Um, that it's it's uh, until you come off them you don't know do you whether they're supporting you that's the whether they're helping you really. well uh, yeah and you may not know for some time as I say because strong. something can hit you yeah and, and you can find yourself yeah in a place 
and at least you know it's a place where you didn't know it was a place once you know but yeah. i mean but then you then i guess you can always go back on them again yeah um tim you you i could hear you you almost wanting to interrupt but we we are approaching the end of the discussion yeah. um one thing that has been interesting is obviously all the men here have found it very easy to talk to one another about depression anxiety suicide um and Tim Lott mentioned earlier about wanting to sort of knock some, knock down some taboos. Um, mm. Tim Roberts, just a final word from you, and then I'll get a final word from these guys here. Yeah. Which taboo would you want to knock down? And what would you say, having gone through various treatments, you know, sort of why, what could you offer in terms of advice that would make more men perhaps talk about mental health? Wow, which taboos? There's so many. Um, well, I, from my, from from my from my perspective, I I would like to see, um, say, the first point of contact is a GP surgery. I'd like to see leaflets, pamphlets, posters that are um, inviting men who may be suffering depression to come in to see the doctor. I, I find that many of the GP surgeries I've been in are, are not very uh, male friendly and um so that's 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 the first thing it there needs to be more um there needs to be more publicity say another male illness um cancer once a year men grow a mustache in 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 november so even that even that male issue is is, is kind of it's in the background compared to other um, health issues so maybe it's going to take somebody in the public eye and there are a few people uh, to come out and talk about depression more regularly. I'm really stuck on that question because it's um, the, the, there are so many taboos. I think a man should be able to um, go to see his employer and discuss his um, situation, say like he's feeling depressed or he's been diagnosed as depressed and not have that used against him. Um, which has it's been used against me in the past. It just needs to be. It almost. I really, really hate to say this, but I think you get me somewhere. It, it, it almost needs to become trendy. But I really hate saying that. It's just that there's certain there's certain things people openly talk about on 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 social networking in the newspaper. Somebody's got an addiction. Um, it, there's almost something cool about that. It's not. There's not at all. But. In terms of the media and the general public, that's not looked down upon as much as depression. So that is, it's a big job to sort it out. That was a big question, but your answers were perfect. Thank you very much, Tim Roberts. Um, I'm going to move now to Tim Lott to say you wanted to knock down some taboos, but you could almost answer what Tim Roberts was saying there about depression becoming trendy. Well... <clears throat> You know, oddly enough, bipolar depression kind of is. You know, a lot of people who are bipolar are quite open about it, and it's quite, you know, from ever since Stephen Fry talked about being bi bipolar, there's loads of people who kind of, uh, I can't think of their names, but it became quite a thing to be be, be bipolar. But possibly in the way, because it's, it's as I understand it, much more medi medical, much more obviously medicalised disease. It's it, it's much closer to being a disease, you know, than than depression, which is much more, you know, blurred lines and and and, and difficult uh, areas. <clears throat> I, I mean, I what I just think, you know, I come back to my point earlier. I don't know if this is uh, on the element of taboo. It's on the it's on the issue of understanding, and, and that, that is that people understand understand the pathology of depression. In other words, they need to understand the difference between depression and, 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 and unhappiness. And this is, to me, as, as they're very different things. And you know, depression has a pathology like you know, uh, uh, not interrupted sleep patterns and appetite and, and things like you know, self-blame and so forth. There's a whole sort of set of symptoms that will quite, quite relatively easily be able to identify whether you're suffering depression or not. And because you can be very, very, very unhappy without being depressed you know so it's it's quite it's quite a separate phenomenon you know and, and i think people 
um, will just say, oh, you know, I'm just, I've got, you know, my, my somebody's died. Of course, I'm, de of course, I'm unhappy. Um, because depression and unhappiness are used interchangeably, quite wrongly. Um, but people go, well, of course, I'm unhappy. This has happened, and that's not happened. And of course, you know, unhappiness is part of life, and you can't escape it. But you need to. It's very important that people understand when it flips into this kind of pathological state where you can't get better on your own you you know when good things will happen to you as tim said about winning the pools it will make no difference whatsoever when good things happen to you, you are unresponsive there's there's no escape from that you're in a prison that you made i'd also recommend people anybody reads um depression the way out of your prison by dorothy rowe which is i think the best book i've ever read on depression and it's it's still very little known but it's a superb book about how you get into the mental trap of depression I'm going to finally end with you, Michael. Um, and just maybe, what would you like to see <clears throat> change? Well, I think that, that the main thing that needs to change is there needs to be a much broader range of treatments for people who go to the GP and, um, uh, you know, with, with these kinds of uh, symptoms of depression, there needs to be a much broader range of therapies, you know. And, um, you know, as I said, Tim's been, I think, been really lucky and, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad to hear that in that he's, he's found a therapist who he can work with who works in, in quite a different way and, and as I understand it, he's been working with him for a number of years but that's so unusual in the NHS, you know, most people get, get not much more than six or eight sessions of CBT. Um, which um, is helpful for some people, but but not most. So I'd just like to see a much broader range of psychological treatments available for people. That was Michael Dunn, a psychotherapist based in London. And I'd like to thank all my guests, Tim Lott, novelist who's written extensively about his experiences of depression, and Tim Roberts, who is a current patient within the mental health system and has experienced chronic depression for 20 years. Thanks to all my guests. It's almost like I had to bang doors down to, to, to speak with somebody. I was put on a course of tablets. Um, the CBT come to an end. But as uh, the years went on, certainly a couple of years after I was diagnosed, um, I, I attempted suicide because I was living in a, a very dark place at the time. And it was not a cry for help. I, I took some very dangerous pills, prescribed pills and um, lost several days um, in A&E and then was transferred to the Mortley Hospital where I spent the best part of a year. Uh, since then, I've had ECT treatment, which uh, is generally known um, as electric shock treatment to people, and various other um, CBT therapies. Uh, but four and a half years ago, I met a psychotherapist um, who's been working with me on something called schema therapy, which is really kind of going back into my past and and seeing where my my defects may have been born into me, as it were, if that makes sense. And uh, but in general, I found as a man with depression and admitting to depression it is a very difficult thing to do. To me, it was many, many, many questions and. Uh, because I had I had very specific issues, a lot of them to do with my body image, um, a lot of them to do with uh, social social um, isolation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the schema therapies work with me because I've been able to go on to specifics, um, going back to my school days. In fact, when I was a bit of a a kind of if you'd like a, a Billy No Mates, but it was not through choice. It's just that I didn't, I didn't feel as though I could interact with other kids. And then as I become a teenager, the same with teenagers. And then as I become an adult with adults, I don't socialize very well. Um, so that therapy has, has helped me um, have to face those things. And part, part of the therapy process is to actually challenge myself and put myself through um, situations that are not very comfortable. 
um, but to experience them and then come back and then review them with my therapist. I, I also heard mindfulness um, mentioned earlier, which um, my current therapist uh, referred me to, and it is a sensational treatment and it needs to be spoken about more. Mindfulness, um, who can elaborate on that for me? Michael's experiences of depression and a nervous breakdown. He's written several books, including The Scent of Dried Roses in 1996, which looks at his family history of depression. We're also joined by Michael Dunn, a psychotherapist who's worked as a psychotherapist in private practice with lots of clients for over 10 years. And during that time, he's also worked with groups in the NHS and for charities. So really, the discussion is about depression and mental health in men. And first of all, Tim Roberts, I'd like to ask you really, you said you've experienced chronic depression for 20 years and you've been institutionalised. Could you tell us about your experience of, of living with depression? Yeah, well, I was uh, first diagnosed uh, so about 20 years ago. Um, I had really had problems, I think, since uh, my, my teenage years, but never quite had um and we never really quite had the nerve to go and to, to go and sort it out or get, go and speak to somebody but it got to a, a, a really bad place in um as i say about 20 years ago i went to a doctor um, i went through a course of um cognitive behavioral therapy and i didn't really think that i was getting the help that i needed um it You're listening to Radio VR with me, Juliet Spare. According to the government's Department of Health, there were approximately 800 more suicides among men and 155 more among women between 2008 and 2010. This number was higher than expected based on their historical trends. The report preventing suicide in England one year on said a rise in poor health status associated with the recession had also been found not only for those unemployed but also among people who had jobs. Suicide continues to be more than three times as common in males compared to females, and one in four people are said to suffer from some sort of mental health problem. Mixed anxiety and depression is the most common mental disorder in Britain. Depression affects one in five older people. But does talking about suicide help society deal with mental illness? Taking part in today's discussion on men and mental health is Tim Roberts, who's joining us on Skype. Tim is a current patient within the mental health system. He has experienced chronic depression for 20 years and is currently receiving therapy on the NHS. I'm also joined in the studio by Tim Lott, a novelist who has written extensively about his... You're instantly judged. Um, I've, I would say more judged um, sort of badly, as it were, than somebody saying, oh, that's a shame, I hope you get better. So I don't know if that's experience for women as well, but certainly as a man, I found it very difficult to confess it to anybody and also to even really uh, be accepted within my family that I suffer with chronic depression. Uh, so many questions, but uh, maybe can I, if I could just start with, um, with the ECT and the cognitive behavioural therapy treatments, and then yeah. you talked about your schema treatment. Um, yeah. what, what's worked for you? Uh, well, the treatment, the, the therapy that I've been on for the last four and a half years, as I'm very, very lucky because I met um, um, I met a psychotherapist uh, through the NHS when I was re-referred because I've gone in and out of the system. And then when I've, when I've had a, a relapse into depression, sometimes I've been able to cope with it just on the medication. Um, I, I take 20 milligrams of citilopram, but sometimes it just goes down so bad that I go back into um, thoughts of self-harm. And around about five, uh, five and a half years ago, it got really bad again. So I was re-referred. And through that referral process, I met my current psychotherapist um, who assessed